What's going on? It is Cody McBroom, the host of the Tailored Life podcast. Today, we have a really cool Q&A. Um, dive into a lot of applicable topics. Uh, this is all from our members in the private Facebook group. So I'm really excited about this one because these people are near and dear to my heart. I know them personally. Uh, and we got, dive into some questions surrounding how to set up the most optimal training program, right? How many times should you train a muscle group in a week and why? What if you don't like doing it that way? Can you do it another way? What if you get bored in your training? We talk about that too. We talk about a flexible training approach that allows you to change your program design every one to two weeks, but still get progress. Because as we know, most of the time, you got to do something for weeks and weeks on end to truly see progressive overload. We also dive into some other common and popular topics like how much weight to gain in a reverse diet, like what's acceptable. Um, we talk about diet relationships, bad relationships with food. And we even talk a little bit about my potential my male modeling career, which as you can probably tell the way I'm saying it is completely a joke, but it is a funny story. So stay tuned for this one, guys. I'm really excited for you to be here. Um, real quick note, there's a link in the description of this podcast. Make sure you, you click that and you go subscribe to the Tailored Life Podcast Clips channel. It is going to be the best place to refer to single questions and single topics. Instead of listening for, for a full hour, sometimes more than an hour, if you don't have that time or you need an immediate answer to a question that you have about training or nutrition or life or entrepreneurship or whatever we're talking about, that is the place to go because they are all sound bites of the episode. So everything is five to 10 minutes a piece. They are clipped up every single week. So it's constant content coming out. If you like podcasts at all, you need to go subscribe to this channel. And once again, that's the Tailored Life Podcast Clips channel. Link is in the description below. Uh, without any further ado, let's get into the Q&A. So I got, um, I don't know if it's flattering or creepy. <laughs> Uh, email today um, about male modeling mm. and he requested me to send him some pictures yeah of uh, specifically of just like literally just my stomach <laughs> and the way he worded it was like really professional but really weird same time and apparently he's like a bodybuilding photographer model agency or something like that and I was like should I be like is this a compliment or should I be kind of like creeped out? Like, yeah. is this really what you do? <laughs> Are you just some guy reaching out, reaching out? Yeah. Cause you want pictures of That's a random right. person you found on Instagram. Did, did he have any like credibility in his profile or I didn't click email? his website, but his website was listed. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't dig that deep cause I have no interest in male modeling, male modeling, especially not sending some random guy pictures online. Yeah. So that was weird. But so that was interesting. Um, another, announcement for today besides my male modeling career potential um the taylor trainer we just Launching got done on february 15th 15th one right. day um oh. and we are going to set it up to where if you sign up relaunching relaunching yeah that, that's actually a really good point um is that what it, what is it is it just called a relaunch when somebody a, like revamps yeah re and does updated it version yeah um Ex extremely upgraded version and uh we're gonna launch it at the 15th of february which as this airs is like a week maybe two weeks away yep i i know it's definitely before then so um it's coming up soon though so make sure you stay on the lookout you're gonna get a seven day free trial uh whether you trust my programming and you want a seven day free trial or not you'll get one um because we're that's like the promo all week um we're also going to be reducing the price of the tailor trainer just to make it more affordable for people. Um, the cool thing about this is, is like just to be fully transparent with everybody, most people will be like, okay, well, you're obviously changing something if you're able to make it, you know, what, it's like going to be $30 cheaper or something like that, you yeah. know? We're going to make it so it's less than a dollar a day. And the truth is, is we actually made things way better. We don't have to do as much manual labor on the back end because we're putting a lot of things in an automated fashion in the app. So it's a new app. It's completely developed to us. You would literally go to the app store and download the Taylor Trainer. Um, it's, it's created for us and with everything we want, but because we worked with developers to do that, it's allowing us to not have to fidget and play with things in the back end with people's programming, their schedule adjustments, because you can do it yourself yep. with the pre-programmed adjustments. Um, and now the Facebook group, which is still going to be a, a reoccurring theme there and, and still going to be present is not somewhere where you go, Hey, I need to change my program or can you edit this for me or anything like that? It's solely for coaching. Like ask me questions, give me videos of you squatting so I can give you feedback. And then it's just an engagement and, and I'll probably start doing more Q and A's and lives and stuff like that. Um, but my goal is to get that super interactive again. Cause it, it always has been pretty interactive. I mean, there's posts going up in there daily, 
like many posts daily, but yeah. the problem, a lot of them are like, Hey, can you change my program or can you adjust my calendar? Which is fine. Cause that's where you contact us. Um, but now you'll be able to do all that on your own, which also means you don't have to wait on anybody. So yeah. like, right, right. We're human beings. We have, you know, we wake up, go to work and we go home to our family. So if you need an adjustment to your training and it's 7 PM on a Tuesday, um, you know, or even worse, like if, if on a weekend on a weekend, yeah. Or like time zone differences, you know, it's actually like fucking midnight for me. Cause you're in Europe or something like that. Yeah. You're going to have to wait, but now it's in your control. You can do it right away. Um, so I'm really, really excited about this. It's going to be less than a dollar a day. You still get access to all my best programs. Everything is literally going to be mapped out for a full year, which is why it's taken me so long to get the app going. But basically this way you step into it and you go, all right, if let's say you're an advanced lifter who you're not necessarily going to cut, you're not necessarily going to bulk. You might do those things in the future or whatever, but you know your style of training that you like, and you can only go to the gym and lift for an hour or so four times a week. The other yeah. days have to be rest or cardio quick sessions. Perfect. You're going to pick a program that matches your goals, that matches your calendar, and then you never have to touch it again. It's literally just an app that's going to be giving you customized programming every day for the fucking year if you want to, right? Yeah. Now, if you get six months in and you're like, hey, I'm changing my goals, I'm going into a fat loss phase, and I was doing a six-day push-pull leg split, I need to lower my volume because I'm just burnt out, cool. You have access to all the programs, you can change it whenever you want. Um, but the way I wanted to do it was basically like, you can just go, and this is why I love like working with somebody as a trainer is like, I just walk to gyms. Like, what am I doing today? Yeah. I don't have to think about it. It just keeps getting updated every day. Um, except you got to pay an arm and a leg for a trainer, obviously, cause it's a customized thing. So now yeah. we're able to give you that for, don't quote me, but I believe we're doing 27 bucks a month, if not 29, but it's going to be cheap as fuck. It's going to be less than a dollar a day, which is, you really can't get expert programming for that cheap. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm stoked. So you said they have full control. They can change the program. Yeah. So basically if you're a what? member, you would go to the app, right? And, and you're in my tailored trainer group. So you would get access to any program that's in the tailored trainer, kind of like it is now. Yeah. Right now you go into the tailored trainer portal and you can opt in for a program. Yeah. When you opt in, it notifies myself and Tori. And then yeah. we go into the true coach system and we put that into your calendar. We give it to you. So on and so forth. Um, problem with that is it might take a day. Yeah. You know, usually we start programs on Monday. So if you do it on a Friday yeah. and you want to start right now, well, you're gonna have to wait till Monday because that's when the next block starts. Yeah. But now the way it works is the portal is the app. So you don't have to go to the computer or go to the website to, to do this. You go to the app, you are in the group, you can see all the programs, you can select which one you want, put it into your own calendar. And if you need to adjust your days, you need to adjust anything in your calendar, you can. Okay. Right. Um, so and you the, can't physically change the program. No, you can't change the program. But I can also, and this is a really cool feature, I can pre-program substitution. So, you know, there's times where somebody's like, hey, I, I don't have, like, I'm in a garage gym. I don't have access to a barbell. What can I do for that back squat instead? Yeah. There's already an, a, a substitution there, yeah. right? Or somebody, the most common one is like, hey, I don't have access to a gym, COVID, right? I'm in a garage gym or I'm in a box or whatever. I don't have a leg press. What do I do instead? There's already an adjustment there. I don't have a leg extension. What do I do? It's already there. So that way, when you're doing the program, you can just click substitute and it'll show you the option. Gotcha. So you don't have to guess or go to the Facebook group, yep. post in there, let me comment back, you yep. know, yep. Um, which obviously I'm always there for, but again, it's not immediate. Yep. Now it's like an immediate solution. So for sure. Um, I'm stuck, man. It's yeah. going to be, it's going to be awesome. Yeah. It's going to be really big. So by the time you're listening to this, members of the trailer trainer who are already in there might already be in this new system. So we're just migrating them over. So they're going to be the first ones to get in and get access to everything so I can get them settled. And then we're going to launch, like I said, seven day free trial. So you get seven days for free just to make sure you love it. Um, there's no commitment. So cool. we don't make you sign a contract or anything. Cool. But stay on the lookout. I'm excited. Yeah, it's going to be going to be great. All right, guys. We are doing another Q&A today. Um, let me get this up. It should be in orange today. All right, so our first question for the day comes from Heather McKean. What is a quote-unquote reasonable weight gain during the reverse dieting stage? Is 20 pounds within three to four months concerning? Hmm. It, <laughs> it depends. Yeah. I always like, <laughs> it's so hard for me not to like chuckle when I say it depends because I kind of feel bad because most people are like, just fucking tell me yes or no. But yeah. Um, it depends on where the person is now. So if I, if I had somebody who came to me and they were like, Hey, I think I need to reverse. And I'm like, 
you're malnourished because you're so lean or so light or like you lost way too much weight and you have nutrient deficiencies now your stress and cortisol is through the roof your thyroid dysfunction is non-existent like all these bad signs right libido is long gone for somebody like that 20 pounds is not unrealistic because you put 10 pounds on them and they look lean put 10 more pounds on them they're still leaner than average, but they're not like shredded like they want to be and not super lean, right? And to them in their head, they're not lean at all probably because there's some do- body dysmorphia that occurs when you go through these weight swings. But to that individual, it's not concerning. They probably needed to gain that weight. Shit, we had uh, Brett Bartholomew on the podcast, right? I don't know if he, his episode has aired yet by the time they listen to this, but he he told that story about going through um, anorexia and then having to go to that, that um, impatient like eating disorder yeah, facility. Dude. So crazy story. Health facility. Yeah, yeah. Crazy story. Yeah. But like he gained a ton of weight. Yeah. And he needed it. Yep. He looked fine afterwards. He looked great, but he needed that to be healthy. So I don't want to say it's concerning because in some people, like that's required. For other people, like if I gained 20 pounds in reverse, I'd be concerned. Because <laughs> yeah. I don't I think it's it's safe to say for a majority it's not. Yeah. For yeah. majority it's not. I would say that yeah. too. I think I think that if you got done with the the amount you should gain in a reverse diet is all dependent on how far um, you take it during your cut, like how lean you get during your cut. Um, for a physique competitor, that's not that unrealistic, right? I'm so I'm, we're taking like a pretty good diet break right now, like starting today, basically, like just because work's crazy, family stress crazy with. Blakely and everything going on. Um, she's fine for people listening, but like we have some stress, new house, all these things. And it's like, this is a good time to take our like halfway point diet break, spend some time at maintenance. And I'm halfway and I've dropped just over 10 pounds, 11 pounds in this cut so far. I'm going to reverse to maintenance. I probably won't gain a single pound because I'm not shredded by any means right now, but I'm leaner than the average person. So if you did a cut like I did and you got to a place where you were like comfortably lean, 20 pounds would be very concerning because you shouldn't like, you're not in a place where you're deprived or malnourished or need to gain weight. I don't need to gain any weight. Um, if I gained weight from reverse, it would be a couple pounds from water retention just because I uptake my carb intake, which isn't a bad thing. Yeah. Now, if I was at the stage of my photo shoot lean, like I get for that 20 pounds isn't, isn't completely unrealistic because if you think about it, if I gain, if I, I'd probably have to lose about probably at least 10 more pounds to get shredded for photo shoot, that would be 20 pounds total. For sure. And I wasn't fat or obese by, at that 20 pound mark. You know what I mean? When yeah. I was heavier, I was just a little fluffy. A little bit heavier. Yeah, a little bit heavier. Um, so I, I do think 20 pounds is a good amount. It's, it's, it's definitely a good amount. I think 10 pounds is, I'm not overly concerned depending on the person. 20 pounds, I'm definitely going to start asking some questions because that is on the higher end. And most people listening to this aren't coming from a place of getting on stage. If you get on stage and you get that lean, 20 pounds is not unrealistic. Most people put 20 pounds on in their off season. Um, If you did a general cut, I would say, yeah, it's probably concerning. 10 pounds at most is what you should be gaining. Um, I, I like to see people get like, I think perfect world scenario is you get just a little bit leaner than what's sustainable just to do it, just so you can see how lean you can get. You can see your muscle definition. You accomplish that goal. You, you build a lot of self-discipline to diet to that lean. Um, so it applies to other areas of your life. And then you reverse diet and gain about five pounds. Mm. Because five pounds away from unsustainably lean, not stage lean, but really lean, five pounds above that is actually a comfortable leanness. It's like where I'm at, I would say, like right now. I could live this way. I'm totally fine. I'm lean. I'm healthy. I won't gain weight in a bad way. But if I was 10 pounds lighter than I am right now, I wouldn't be able to sustain it. Because that's just not what my body wants. It's fighting homeostasis. Touche. So I would say above 10 pounds is where I start questioning things for sure. Um, unless you're a competitor, uh, five pounds is probably the ideal range for a reverse diet. Because two to three pounds is going to happen just from water retention with carbs, no matter what. You know, it's just, a, it's a given. And some, some for some people, even more. If you hold on to carbs really well or... I mean, shit, if somebody adds 200 grams of carbs in a reverse diet, you know, that's six to 800 grams of water because yeah. every one gram of carb holds three to four grams of water. So it's like, yeah. A lot of water weight. Yeah, it's hard yeah. to say. And that's good. I mean, it's not bad water weight, but it's usually in the muscle, but still shows on the scale. Touche. You know? Cool. All right. Next one is going to be from Anya Civic. Uh, it says... For a client that gets bored easily, how do you how do you program workouts? 
if we keep a program for a month, which exercise to keep, or if if we keep a program for a month, which exercises to keep for a whole month, and what can vary workout to workout? Yeah. So before I get into the specific question, I think my favorite way to program is three week blocks. I've, I mean, I've worked with so many people now, and I I really and even just observing people in the membership, observing my personal clients. Four weeks, like by week four, people are starting to get bored. And I'd rather not let boredom even sink in because mm-hmm. then your mind starts wandering around like program hopping. Um, however, very small percentage of people, but there is a percentage of people that actually gets anxiety when you change too many things. These are the people that are like very agenda routine focused and yeah. they get in their zone. You know, I've had those clients and we do eight week blocks. So I'm like, you, you take a few weeks just to get used to the program get comfortable and like familiar and once you're familiar you can thrive so let's spend some time there and I don't want to change it and you create anxiety over it so we spent a little bit longer there but for 90% or more of people I think three weeks is ideal there's bodybuilders that will push that because they're routine individuals and, and technically progressive overload as long as it's happening you can continue doing it as long as you want we were talking about that with you and Joe's yeah for sure um but three weeks tends to be the point where it's like Week one, it's novel. It's a new stimulus. Week two, you can start to progress because you've learned the movement. Week three, you you max out your capability with that movement. Week four, you're learning new movements, which kind of is like a self-implemented deload because yeah. you can't go super heavy on a new exercise that you're trying to learn. And then week two happens again. Week three happens again. Then you go back to the beginning. Um, now, in her scenario, like based on her question, what I would keep is the compound lifts, bench, squat, deadlift, overhead press, because those are the, the main fundamental movements that you are going to try to progressively overload over time. Um, secondary to that, I would consider keeping any, uh, I would call them secondary compound movements. So a, a secondary compound movement, two for me are dumbbell bench press and CD cable row. Those two are not compound lifts, but I really like them for the muscles they're targeting. They're, they feel good with me and there's room to progress. For me. So for sure. I'm going to, I'm going to keep those in more consistently. Cause I know I can keep adding weight and keep adding reps or volume. Whereas like a dumbbell curl, like I could do it for a few weeks mm-hmm. and maybe progress, but probably not. Yeah. It's probably just like the same weight, same load, same volume for three weeks. And then I need to change it. You know what I mean? Um, so if you do that, it's, it, it works pretty well. Four weeks of, of just following a compound lift to make sure you're progressing. And then any accessory work can change. And there was actually a really cool study I can't remember what the study was called. It was in Mass Research Review, um, which I've mentioned so many times. If you guys aren't subscribed to Mass and you're a coach or you want to learn, go subscribe to Mass. It's like the best place to get the newest research broken down in a simple format. Um, But I want to say it had something to do with being called like a flexible approach to training. And basically what they did is they focused on movement patterns instead of exercise selection. So... I don't know if they changed the compound lifts, but all the accessory movements, they would change out weekly in one group and then they would keep it for four week blocks in the other group. So basically if I was doing a seated cable row, it wouldn't say seated cable row, it'd say horizontal row. Mm -hmm. So if I come in today and I have a horizontal row for eight reps, I could do a seated cable row and next week I could do a one arm dumbbell row. And then the week after that I could do a barbell bent row. The week after that I could do a weighted inverted row. They're all the same exact movement pattern, right? They're just slightly different variations, grips, loading, whatever. Um, but they're all horizontal pull. Yeah. Um, the other group, they did seated cable row every single week for four weeks, right? And neither was better. They didn't see a better progress. Either. I think it was at least an eight week study, but that just goes to show like, well, hey, shit, we don't have to keep the same exercises every single week in order to progress because this group changed it every week and they saw just as much progress as the group that didn't. Now, if we look at the history of powerlifting, I don't think that would apply to the compound lifts because we know a lot of doing a barbell back squat for strength and and heavy loads, it's skill. So you need, your nervous system needs to adapt to being under that bar, doing that movement, that specific way. So if you do a back squat and then a front squat and then some other kind of squat, it's not always the same, especially because loads change. That can be argued because West Side Conjugate changes it every single week and they're freaks of nature. (laughs) So it's hard to say, but in my opinion, if, if I have a client who's like, I want to be stronger, but I want to look really good, I'm going to keep the compound lifts. Um, and if they get bored, I'm going to change the weekly accessory work or biweekly. So like keep it for two weeks and then change it. So in a four-week block, you'll have a 
conventional deadlift for five reps every week, let's say, and then you might have two weeks of accessory work and then two weeks of different variations of those accessories. Mm. Um, and that would work totally fine. Um, so yeah, and you could change it weekly. I just think that's, to me, changing weekly is overkill for accessory work because one, that's a lot of work on the coach. Two, it's kind of useless. It's like you don't even get a small chance to change that progression. Um, I don't know. And the last thing I'll say with that too is if you're an advanced lifter, I think this concept applies better, right? Because there's a learning curve. So I can change the horizontal row every single week, but I can guarantee we'll go through 50 different horizontal row variations and they're all ones I've done many times. So it's easy for me to go heavy and challenge my body doing a new exercise, right? But for somebody who's like, oh shit, I've never done a neutral grip seated cable row. Well, shit, now we got to learn how to do it. Yeah. Next week, we might be able to add weight, but if you change it, we won't be able to add load, so you won't reach your full potential. So I think it's a better trick for advanced lifters, and most importantly, for people who travel, this is key. Because if you go to a hotel gym, you have your program, don't look at the exercises, look at the movements, and if they don't have all the equipment, you need to adjust, mimic the movement pattern, and change the stimulus. There you go. So That's great. Um, all right, so next question is coming from Talia Salzar. Uh, how perfect do you need to track macros, like even chewing gum? Also, how do you hit a range of calories but still be in a deficit? Please don't sh- track your chewing gum. <laughs> don't do it. That just that is literally is a recipe for failure. Well, I was going to say bad relationship with food, but ultimately failure. Yeah, same Because thing. that will lead to failure. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, and burnout. Burnout is right. Um, now, if you're chewing so much gum that the calories from sugar-free gum – would have an impact on your caloric intake, you're chewing way too much fucking gum. Yeah. I think a pack of gum has what, like 12 sticks, 16 sticks maybe? Sure. I mean, I would probably know. Yeah. Um, I think there's... I would say 12. I think it's 15 in the extra because I think it's five by five in those three rows. I chew a lot of gum. You know this. But there's five calories per stick and it's artificial sweetener, so it's not really like true calories. But still... What's uh, 15 times 5? 45. 45. So you'd have to chew, like 45 is not really a significant amount of calories, especially yeah. from artificial sweeteners. You'd have to chew a few packs a day yeah. <laughs> for it to start. Damn. Which I have heard moving, about. Moving through it. Like competitors who are dieting and they're trying to blunt their hunger. I've heard of them running through gum. Damn. But I feel like you would be so bloated and gassy before you even get a chance for the calories to matter. Yeah. Because you just have so much air from chewing. Um. But yeah, I, I don't I don't think that's necessary. Um, now, there are certain things that I question. Like there's uh, like I, I have like sugar free syrup, you know, and there's like in one serving. Uh, I don't know how many. I mean, probably like ten carbs or something like that. But it's not sugar. It's like does it count? I count it yeah. because I'm like, that is a solid form of something. <laughs> like I'm eating it. Yeah. It's not air. So I'm going to count those calories, right? Um, and I swallow it. I don't swallow gum. <laughs> so if that counts for anything. Um, but I, for the most part, I think no. Like that's like like this, I think has, this is a zero calorie thing, but it has one carb in it. So technically it's not zero calories. I don't, I'm not going to track a Gatorade zero. You yeah. know, it's just like, it's just, that's just getting neurotic. Um, so how precise do you need to be? I always tell people that, you should track anything that has caloric density um, with a small increment of food. And what I mean by that is like like spinach, for example. Spinach, yes, it's low calorie. That doesn't mean you shouldn't track it because it's not because it's low calorie. But you have to have like like let's say like a handful of spinach is ten calories. You would have to have like four handfuls for it to be like. 12 calories. You know what I mean? Like you have to eat so much more. So at that point, just estimate. Yeah. I just throw some in the pan. I'm like, that's probably a cup. I'm going to enter a cup, you know, broccoli. That's two cups. Maybe it's three, but that's a difference of three calories, three carbs or what? Three carbs, nine calories, whatever it is, 12 calories. Fuck it. I don't care. It's not worth spending the time doing, um, until you're like getting on stage at that point, every macro matters and you should track pretty detailed. Um, now steak, one ounce of steak is pretty calorically dense. There is a good amount of fat in it. There's a good amount of protein in it. You should weigh and measure your steak to the gram. Like that makes sense. Peanut butter, same thing. It makes sense. So use your best judgment and, and be meticulous with the foods that matter, that matter to be meticulous with. And then when it comes to your daily macros, 
I always say to clients, you know, for your protein and your carbs, being within five to 10 grams of your target prescribed number that I gave you is like an A plus. So if I prescribe you 200, 200 grams of protein, 200 grams carbs, just for easy math, and you hit 205 protein and 207 carb, that's an A plus, you're fine, mm-hmm. right? And the next day you might hit 192 carb because you're a little bit below and 203 a little bit above protein, you're fine. Five to 10 grams. Obviously, the closer to the number you get, the better, but we can't predict. I actually had this conversation with one of my clients the other day. We don't know that a chicken breast is actually as much as it says in my fitness pal. Like it says two grams of fat, 26 grams of protein for a four ounce average size chicken breast. No way in hell we know that. There's just no way. Just, because, and it sounds weird, every chicken lived a different life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not to get philosoph- so- philosophical here, but every chicken walked a different amount of miles in their life. Every chicken <laughs> built a different amount of muscle. Every chicken had different genetics. Yeah. Every chicken had a different appetite. Yeah. So every chicken has a different amount of fat and different amount of muscle on it. Not a lot because it's a small bird, but it's still different. And we can't really say that it's 26 grams exactly. So the point with that is that even accurate food labels are still an estimate. Yep. And real food labels like this one right here that's like a label, I can scan it. Those are actually 20 to 25% off. Yeah. They can be. They're not all off. Some of them are really spot on. But legally, food is allowed to be 20 to 25% off. So as long as they're within 20 to 25% range. So if a 200 calorie uh, product is 25% off, it could be 250 calories. Yeah. You know, by the end of the day, who knows what that is? You, you That adds up, you know, especially if you're eating a lot of processed food because those are the ones that do that. Um, so being within five to 10 of carbs and protein is totally fine. Being within, I say three to five grams of fat is great. Uh, fat's more calorically dense. So you want to be closer to that. Um, but you're never going to be spot on. If you try to be spot on, I, I, it's a red flag when I see a client's tracker and it's like, all right, I prescribed you 200 protein, 200 carb, 50 fat. And it's literally 200, 250, 200, 250 every day. And I'll like message them and be like, Hey, is that actually what you hit? Or are you just like estimating up or down based on what my fitness pal says? Like you actually hit 198. So you just said 200. Like, no, I, I like, configure it until I hit the numbers exactly. And that's when I'm like, Hey, that's an issue. Yeah. Don't do that. That's not healthy for your mind. Um, and the range thing, this is why a range applies because you're never actually going to be perfectly exact. Therefore, if you think you're at 2000 calories today, you're probably not, you're probably between 2100 and 1900, which is still relatively close, right? A hundred calorie difference. Um, but you also got to realize that you know, I didn't sleep much this weekend. So I definitely burned less calories this weekend because you burn a lot of calories during sleep. Yep. And sleep causes recovery and that helps burn calories throughout the day because you have more energy. So my intake didn't change because I didn't sleep at all. You know what I mean? But like that's the thing is is these ranges kind of allow that buffer room because certain days you burn more, certain days you burn less. Um, certain things you eat are more accurate, certain things are not. And at the end of the day, like maintenance is a range. And so your deficit's going to be a range. Like there is no exact numbers in this game. It's all really good, knowledgeable estimates. Yep. Touche. That's crazy that 20 to 25%. That's wild. It should be illegal. Yeah. I mean, people probably think I'm like OCD asshole. Like, okay, diet dude. Yeah. (laughs) That should be illegal. But it's, it's the truth. Don't put it on the label if it's a lie. All right, next question comes from Stacy Hammett. Uh, it says, pre-workout that doesn't make you jittery or keep you awake. Oh, I'm, she might be asking f- for recommendations. Uh, I train at 4.30 p.m., so looking for something that won't disrupt my sleep, even if it, if it even exists. Cue the Legion ad. I'm just playing. Um, actually... <laughs> There's other brands that do this too. So it's not, this is not like only Legion does this, but uh, the pre-workout that you see me take all the time. Yeah. Uh, they make a stimulant free version of that. So the best thing to do, like the thing in pre-workout that's making you jittery and making you stay up all night is caffeine. Um, beta alanine, if taken at a good amount, will give you that tingling feeling, but that's not really jitters. You know, jitters is like kind of anxiety. You're shaky. Like you have like a lot of energy. That's caffeine. You're just really sensitive to caffeine. Whereas somebody like me, I I drink a cup of coffee at night after dinner sometimes just because I like warm. I, I started buying decaf because I was like, it's probably better. It'll be like 7.30 p.m. and I'll have a cup of coffee and I'm out like a fucking lamp. Yeah. It's just every night. 
I'm not sensitive to caffeine. Yeah. I probably ruined my caffeine receptors or whatever <laughs> is tr- <laughs> getting triggered by caffeine. Yeah. From years of just drinking too much. But, um, dude, do you remember Red Lines? The bike? No, the energy oh, drink. Oh, yeah. Like, you had to be 18 years old to buy it. Yeah. That's how much caffeine was in it. Wow. And Luca used to stock the fridge at the gym with him. <laughs> Dude, we'd drink, like, a few a day. Yeah. And we are like, training at 11 p.m., just fucking go Holy hard. Holy shit. Go to the midnight diner. Same with those things. I hate those five-hour energies. Yeah, I never do those. No. But anyway. It's a, that's a good idea for a product. For a product. I just, I enjoy the taste of a classic energy drink. Yeah. So I'd rather drink it. But, um... Yeah, I think if you like, if you're somebody who gets jittery from pre workout, it's the caffeine. Try a stimulant free one. Obviously, I'm going to recommend Legions. Yeah. Theirs is actually the only one I've tried. Um, it was before I was uh, sponsored by them, too. I just wanted to cut my caffeine back. Um, <laughs> gave that up a while ago. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I. What's that? I was going to say, when was that? Yeah, no shit. <laughs> it was a while ago, <laughs> and it didn't last very long. Once that tub of stimulant free pre workout was done. I was done with yeah. it, but, uh, but it worked. I mean, the thing is, is like the things that help you build muscle and burn fat caffeine does because it gives you more energy. And if your energy goes up, your performance goes up and that indirectly improves those things. But beta alanine, citrulline malate, um, betaine, like all these things that are like good supplements for like strictly body composition or strength or recovery. Those are all in it too. They just take the caffeine out and you don't get the jitters. You don't stay up all night. It doesn't fuck with your sleep. So I would recommend Legions, obviously, because there's a link in the bio and you can save 20% using our code. But even if you use somebody else's, just Google search stimulant-free pre-workout. Yeah. There's plenty out there. Yep. Um, I've even had people, like when I was cutting caffeine out, I, I did that for my pre-workout and I did decaf coffee during the day and in the morning. And it was because I knew it would be hard for me to cut out caffeine. So I was like, I'll just fucking placebo my effect. <laughs> into thinking I'm drinking caffeine. So basically what I did is I, I'm just drinking decaf. And unless I'm really thinking about it, you know, or like telling myself I'm not going to get energy because this shit sucks, it's decaf, I usually feel fine. Like, yeah. And then I realize like, oh, actually, I don't need that caffeine. I'm doing well, you know. Um, so try that. I mean, that's, you there know. You go. Some great advice. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, on to the next one here from Derek Meir. Uh, it says, when you say hit each muscle group multiple times a week, must it be equally spread out like two chest exercises on upper and on push? Or can it be upper being chest focused with three to four exercises and then push being shoulder and try focused just one chest exercise, for example? When I spread equally, I feel like I never work the muscle hard enough. I have a really detailed answer for this, but first, I just thought of something that would be really funny to do is make a shirt that says <laughs> Team Placebo on it. There you go. Or we can make two, Team Placebo and something else, no, like No Placebo, No Sebo. Yeah. That's like, I think that's actually what they called No Sebo. No Sebo? Yeah. And we get like Plus- podcast listeners, whose team are you on? Yeah. Team Placebo Send or not? Send a shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Start a camp. Um, all right. Uh, so there's a few things to consider here. Like, the best thing to do is to split your, your volume up evenly. Most studies show that beyond about eight sets for like a really advanced individual or somebody doing like warm up sets leading, like when I say this many sets per week or per session, I'm talking about working sets. So if I have back squats and it's four sets, but I do just the bar and then I do 35 or 45s on there and then I do 45 and a 25 on each side. And then my first working set is like 225. I'm talking about the working sets. Yeah. It's not that those sets didn't accomplish anything. It's just that when they consider like volume for hypertrophy, most of the time we're talking about working sets in the gym, like effective working sets. Um, beyond about eight sets in a single session on a muscle group tends to start having diminishing returns. They actually see a decline in, I believe, muscle protein synthesis and some other hormonal processes that happen to help muscle growth. Um, so having one bro sesh, like that's great. And this is the hard part because there was one study too where they actually showed you can do all your volume in one day for the chest and wait a week. But as long as you get the same amount of volume that you would in multiple sessions. But 90% of studies show that it's better to do two or more sessions per week, partially because you can do more volume that way because you have more energy. If I do four sets of bench press and four sets of flies, 
Like, I'm, my chest is pretty smoked. And then if I was like, well, this is my only chest day, so I got to do push up still, I got to do incline, like, all of those loads are going to be lighter and my form is going to be shittier because, and secondary muscle groups are going to start firing, right? Like, my chest is so fatigued, my shoulders and my triceps are going to start trying to help me do my chest exercise because they're secondary muscles. Yeah. Um, so I always suggest doing an upper lower split or a push pull leg, something like that, where you're doing two days. And I wouldn't do chest all in one day and then shoulders and triceps on one day because you should do like a perfect thing would be like if you were doing a push pull leg split, this is the best way to maximize as much hypertrophy as possible as a natural lifter. You have push day and maybe you start with bench and then go to flies, four sets, four sets. That's eight sets total of working, which is at the top end of what is going to provide a good amount of gains, not spend a ton of time in the gym, um, and you're not going to have diminishing returns. Then you move to shoulders because that's the next compound muscle group. You go dumbbell military press and lateral raises, four and four. That's eight sets for your shoulders, which you could even argue you could do like four and three because it's a smaller muscle group. You could probably get away with like seven sets or even start there and work up. And then you finish with triceps and you do tricep pushdowns and tricep extensions for three and three. It's a much smaller muscle group. You don't need as many sets in a session. But right there is not a crazy long workout. That's six exercises, three muscle groups, all in the pushing movement pattern. And you maximize your hypertrophy in that session. And it, you, he's kind of saying like, if I do... Like, if he does that, he's not going to feel like he's getting the most out of it. Did I promise you? Go to the gym. Do I mean shit? If you if you're in Taylor Trainer, because this is these are all from the members Facebook group still. So if you're in the Taylor Trainer, check out the the high volume hypertrophy program because it's it is literally modeled after this. And it, this is what I did for my gaining phase, and I gained like fucking sixteen pounds over many months. But still, um, bench, fly, military press, lateral raise, tricep push down, tricep extension. Do that and tell me that you didn't get a nasty pump in your chest, then a nasty pump in your shoulders, and then a nasty pump in your triceps. You will. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing is that's Monday. Thursday, you're fresh because you didn't just demolish your chest or your shoulders. You did a, a fair amount that fatigued you but didn't burn you out. By Thursday, you're fresh. It's another push day. <laughs> now we're going to start with a barbell overhead press because we started with a barbell bench press last time, four sets, and we're going to do a cable upright row, four sets, right? That's eight sets on your shoulders. Then we're going to do a dumbbell incline bench press low incline bench press that's chest and let's say dips or another fly variation or deficit push up something else for your chest that's eight sets then we're going to finish with two other tricep exercises so we have these two days with eight sets per muscle group per week on everything except the arms which would be three each so six total per session and now we have 12 sets of triceps in a week and we have 16 sets of chest and shoulders in a week which is midway of like the maximum like threshold we have that bell curve of like 10 sets per week Per muscle group is pretty optimal for hypertrophy. 20 is the higher end. Mm -hmm. You're always going to be in that bell curve. I find most people are between 10 and 15 because 20 is like, it's brutal. Yeah. And you got to spend a lot of time in the gym. So 16 is a perfect middle point. And I promise you will get a lot out of that. So um, that's how I would do it. Why I would recommend that is, is, is one, because you can't refute research. Research shows time and time again that splitting your mu your muscle groups up, splitting your volume up for two times per week or three times per week versus one times per week, 99% of the time outperforms doing it one time a week. So why not just trust science and just follow suit, you know? The other side of it is I know from experience that like when I first started, I did a bro split. So I would have a chest day and I would do like one or two chest exercises and then I would just be fried. So I have mm -hmm. shitty form. Secondary muscle groups are firing more than my primary muscle groups overuse injury is likely to happen, so on and so forth. You just get burnt out. So like it's not as optimal for a performance and recovery standpoint or an injury risk standpoint. Um, and research shows that it's better this way. Um, so yeah, that's how I would do it. And, and if you want to do like a five day split, you could do an upper lower push pull legs, but I still wouldn't have like separated muscle groups. For upper sure. would be pushing and pulling <clears throat> and, and arms or whatever. And then the push day would be chest, shoulders, triceps. Yeah. So for sure. I think that answers the whole question. Yeah. Broke it down each part. All right. Uh, last question today is uh, Claudia P. Ramirez. What do you think of R RPR, Reactive Performance Reset? Your program has, has focused on activation and wondered if you come across RPR. That is not where I got my priming and activation and stuff. And I tried to Google this because I never heard of it. And the only thing that would come up was reactive, uh, or I'm sorry, reflexive performance 
what was the last word? Reset. Reset. Reflexive. Reflexive. So it's like a stretching. It's basically like a cool down kind of thing. So basically what their, their concept is, is when you train, you go into a sympathetic tone of your nervous system, which is fight or flight. Adrenaline, cortisol, everything goes up. We talk about this all the time. High energy, high demand, high stress. After we work out, we want to get out of that, right? Because we want to be able to cover. We want to be able to calm down, stress to lower, cortisol reduction. This thing that they're talking about is basically a way to shift from sympathetic to parasympathetic. Like that's the goal of this RPR. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't know if there's something far less popular called reactive performance reset that I haven't heard of. Um, Or she might be talking about um, uh, potentiation. Uh, Why am I losing my train of thought? This is something that's been around for decades. But basically the idea of like, you do a squat jump mm-hmm. or classic a box jump or a squat. Either one. Okay. So classically you do uh, it in the reverse of what I do with most people. What I do with most people is like we fire some muscles that are going to open up joints. Then we do something explosive that mimics the pattern you're going to do for strength after because doing that primes your nervous system because you're being explosive. So it actually puts you more into sympathetic because it's a stimulant to your nervous system and you're doing it in a pattern that mimics the strength movement you're about to do. So if I do a box jump, that's a squat pattern. And then I go do a barbell back squat after I've done a few sets of explosive box jumps. That's going to prime me for the squat jump. Yep. Um, Man, I'm going to, I'm going to, it's going to kill me that I can't think of what it is. Something potentiation, but basically what this is, is, and I don't think it's phase potentiation, but maybe it is doing a barbell back squat and then immediately going into a jump squat. Right. And that's a form of potentiation. And what that idea is, it's almost like a slingshot, you know, pull it back, let it rip. You're pulling it back. That's that squat. You're resisting, resisting, resisting. Step forward, do some bodyweight jump squats or box squat jumps. Um, that That's something different than what she's talking about. Um, and that is where I got what I do. For from. sure. Yeah. Um, I learned it from many people. I mean, did you look it up? Phase potentiation. Um, the strategic sequencing of programming phases to increase the potential of subsequent phases and increase long-term adaptive potential. That's what I thought it was. And that's why that's not the same thing. Cause that's, that's saying like, uh, month one, we're doing strength month two, we're doing hypertrophy month three, like it's pure long-term periodization phase potentiation. I'm potentiating myself. So a a good example of this is doing like a four week strength block where you're doing low numbers just to build strength and charge your nervous system over four weeks to then move into a hypertrophy program. Right, or you could flip it in reverse, do a hypertrophy program to build muscle, so it has the potential to build be stronger. Mm, You're potentiating okay. before the phase. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll think of it, and then I'll kick myself for it, or somebody's going to DM me and be like, "Is this what you meant?" And I'm yeah. like, "Yep." Um, but it's this idea that you do something hard or heavy, and then you do something explosive afterwards. I do it in the reverse because of things I've learned from many people over the years. Um, one person that really beat it into my head uh, was John Russ and because he has like a seven phase dynamic warm up, and you go through like active release therapy, like foam rolling, stuff like that. Then you go through um, dynamic movements, so like mobility. Then you go through um, some kind of activation, so this is where like face pulls, things like that. Eventually you do like an explosive movement in yeah. that, right? And it's basically like building you up into to be primed and ready for the workout. The way I do it is like, all right, for most days, we're gonna activate the core with some anti-resistance, Then we're going to like fire the supporting muscle groups for the joints, which is usually the opposite of what you're doing. So on a squat, I'm going to fire my hamstrings, right? On a a bench, I'm going to fire my traps and rear delts, rotator cuffs, things like that. So it's usually like if if you're squatting, you're on the front, right? Quads, hit your hamstrings. The only time it's different is is deadlift. I usually do glutes. But something for your core, anti-resistance is going to be Pal off press, side plank, something that is avoiding rotation because it creates trunk stability. Mm-hmm. So your core is going to be stronger and ready to brace when you get under a bar. You do something heavy. Um, and then I do something explosive. So on a squat day, it might be um, hamstring curls, side plank, and I might even throw a face pull in there. And then after I'm done doing that activation circuit, I'll go do weighted jump squats, box jumps, broad jumps, some kind of si- like squat pattern movement that's explosive for three reps, five at most, and I'm doing three to five sets of them. So I'm taking my time. I'm being explosive. It's not like fast paced box jumps. It's like, I want to jump as high as I fucking can prime my nervous system. Then I'm going to go do back squats and I'm going to be primed and ready. My nervous system is going to be stimulated and ready to squat heavy for sure. That's what I do. It's, it's kind of taking that concept and flipping it on its head. I'm not the first one to do that. 
John Russin, Joe DeFranco, Jason Brown, like so many guys I know in the industry do that as well. Um, and some of it's not really backed by research because for the most part, there's theories about what the nervous system's doing during training. And that's where we create these concepts from, but they're, they're rarely doing studies like this because nobody's going to pay to do a study on this. Nobody's arguing it. Yeah. That's not a debated thing. Um, and there's pro athletes, all these people are doing it. So, um, that's what I do. That's where I got it from. I think you're thinking of the, it starts with the B. I don't even know it's potentiation now. Um, I almost want you to just type in, I don't even know what you would type in. What do you, what is it called doing a, a jump before a squat? See if anything pops up or even explosive jump before a squat. A burpee? <laughs> is that what came up? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, I guess that's kind what of. What is it called? What is it called? A jump before a squat. Type in uh, explosive jump before a squat. Uh, to provide yourself as you need to jump, hence the name. This requires a, a triple extension. Your hip angles extension create maximum yeah. power. Triple extensions. Oh, Which, ply me, uh No, not plyometric. Oh. It's a type of plyometric. Squat jump. Lateral benefits, variation techniques. I don't know, man. Somebody listening will correct me. And I'm going to feel like an idiot when I think of it because I've literally, I mean, this is something I learned in like the first personal training certificate I took when I was like 18 years old. Yeah. So I've known this forever, but um, works well. That's what I do. I, uh, the thing that came up when you mentioned the thing you mentioned was uh, reflexive uh, performance reset and this is an idea that i th i don't even know what they do i didn't really look into it they, they but that's in reactive yeah and i looked up there was nothing under mm. reactive when i googled it It was all this reflexive and there was many people talking about it and it was something that gets you into a sympathetic or parasympathetic state from a sympathetic by the looks of the marketing i think it's like a massage or a stretching protocol or something like that i'm a fan of just carbs and protein after your workout because that does the same thing or even breathing like laying down and doing belly breathing that's going to calm your nervous system down do the same exact thing so definitely beneficial but it's it's completely different it's calming you down after you're already ramped up versus sure. i'm trying to ramp you up before we do some kind of strength movement gotcha so cool man that's the uh, last question for today um yeah, everybody keep out the lookout for the new taylor trainer app uh drop february 15th and it's gonna be epic yep anything else uh go check out the youtube's podcast clips channel yep we'll link that in the show notes um everything from this uh episode from the all the good ones yep questions broken down into individual clips yep check it out and that one is i feel like it's fine it's like i don't say finally like i've been waiting forever or anything but it's now it's at the point where it's like that shit's up and running now yeah. you know what i mean like weeks ago when we started creating, it was like, all right, we got to figure out how we want to do this. Now I feel like there's a system around it. There's a lot of shit popping up in there. Yeah. So go subscribe. I mean, it's literally like, I, I you know what I was thinking about the other day? Cause it like popped up on my feed. I was like, man, there's a handful of shows I wish would do this. Yeah. Because there's a lot of shows I really love, but sometimes I'm like, fuck, like this is going to be a conversation with somebody I really respect but I've heard a million times and I don't necessarily want to listen to the whole thing or yeah. I don't want to hear them tell their story for 30 minutes. Cause I've already heard their story a million times. Yeah. So, cause we do this for the <clears throat> interviews too. Yep. Um, and the Q and a, it's like, that's perfect. Like, and I think it'll do well too when somebody types in like BCAs for muscle growth and then a question from our podcast pops up and yeah. it's not like an hour and a half long podcast. It's five about minutes that. about that. Yeah. So go check out that guys. We're putting a lot of work into the YouTube in general. Um, just quality wise, content wise, trying to make sure that we're putting out a lot of stuff there, especially with the podcast. So do us a huge favor. If you enjoy this podcast, even if you don't really use YouTube and you, you listen on iTunes just for the support reason, because when you support us, we can do more of these go subscribe. It does help. It makes a difference because YouTube gives you more kudos and capabilities when you get more subscribers. So we need you to help us out with that. Um, click the link in the description, just hit subscribe. We thank you for it. Yep. See you next week. <laughs>